All right, so we're going to talk about proteins specifically in this little discussion, both from Chapter 5 and the discussion that's in Section 8.4. We're going to see how the protein structure relates to its overall function. If I were to start with function, I'd want to talk about the overall three-dimensional shape of the protein and how that relates to what it does. Each protein is going to need a very specific uh, shape in order to interact with a particular chemical. So uh, in this little cartoon here, perhaps the, uh, the blue shape here is the protein, and then this is the chemical that it interacts with. Uh, it has that shape, so it fits in there. Uh, maybe you remember the lock and key mechanism from a ninth grade discussion. Uh, and then it, it does something with that chemical. Uh, so that's actually uh, uh, this type of protein that I was discussing is, is an enzyme protein. I'm going to try and go through some types of proteins that we're going to see later in this year. I'm not very happy with the list of proteins that your book gives you in a table. Um, I would rather you focus on these. Enzyme proteins are going to be one that we discuss this unit, so you should really focus your attention there. Again, the, uh, the protein, the enzyme itself is going to be in blue here. And uh, the chemical that it interacts with, every chemical, every enzyme has a particular chemical that, that it interacts with, and we call it the, the chemical substrate. Uh, so this particular enzyme interacts with this chemical, it binds and it forms what's sometimes called the enzyme substrate complex, and then it, it allows the substrate to undergo a chemical reaction, it, it speeds up that chemical reaction, and then lets go the products. In this case, it looks like this is a hydrolytic enzyme because it looks like it's taking a bigger substrate chemical and cutting it up and releasing two products. However, there are also enzymes that do just the opposite. So there are other enzymes that might take two substrates. Uh, in this case, um, the two substrates come in and bind to the enzyme, and it actually speeds up a chemical reaction of their combination. So there might be other enzymes doing synthesis reactions or speeding them up anyway. Uh, but all enzymes have one particular substrate that they interact with with their three-dimensional shape and speed up that chemical reaction. Okay. There's a second class of proteins that we'll talk about next unit called transport proteins. These are proteins with particular shapes to allow particular particles to cross through them into uh, across the membrane. Transport proteins um, exist in membranes. So maybe this particular protein over here takes this green hexagon particle and allows it to cross, whereas this transport protein over here has a different shape because maybe it allows this blue oval particle to cross through it. Different proteins allow different particles to cross. Motor proteins are another pro uh, type of protein that we're going to see later, and they essentially transport materials as well, uh, but they carry them just inside of a cell from one place to another. Motor proteins effectively have little legs that kind of walk along this cytoskeletal fiber, and they're carrying something of value, say, from one organelle to another. A fourth type of protein is the transcription factor. Uh, they're all shown right here. Transcription factors have particular shapes to bind to particular DNA regions. And what they're effectively going to do is they're going to control how often another protein can come in and copy that DNA in order to eventually make a protein later. Transcription factors control the rate of the production of other proteins. Histones are another type of protein that we'll see later, and they actually can also affect the rate of production of other proteins, uh, but just in a slightly different way. Histone proteins are shown in blue here, and they're wrapped around the uh, DNA, as shown here in purple. And histones can effectively unwrap themselves to make the DNA more accessible in a certain region, or they might be told by other chemical signals to wind up a particular region, as shown on the left here, and make it more inaccessible to make proteins in that particular DNA region. So uh, we'll talk more about histones later. So all I'm trying to get across is that there are many different protein types, but all of them need a particular shape in order to carry out their job. Uh, a fancier word for three-dimensional uh, shape is three-dimensional conformation. And so what we're eventually going to discuss here is how proteins broadly obtain that shape. They're all going to 
uh, obtain a particular shape because there are many chemical bonds that form as it's folding up that lock it into that shape. And so eventually in lab, we're going to discuss this concept that maybe environmental factors might break those chemical bonds. If a protein loses its chemical shape, or if those bonds break and cause it to lose its shape, it's going to lose its function. It's not going to be able to do its job anymore. Your book calls that denaturation, and I'm going to allow you guys to investigate what kinds of factors denature proteins um, and what maybe just um, um, alter it in other ways. Okay, so if we're ready to talk about how proteins form, it's good to have a brief discussion of uh, what makes up proteins. So proteins also have monomers that can, uh, the, the Legos of, of, of proteins that can combine over and over and over again in order to make a protein of, of, of a particular size. The Lego or the monomer of proteins are called amino acids. Um, so there's actually 20 different amino acids that your book shows in diagrams. I've just shown three particular ones here. Um, if we were to quickly survey what kinds of atoms we find in, in uh, pr uh, amino acids, then we'd find uh, the carbon, the hydrogen, and the oxygen that we find also in carbs and lipids. We also find nitrogens, just like we do in nucleic acids, and then unique to certain amino acids, uh, but only found in proteins, are sulfur. That's, that atom is, is unique to proteins. So if we were to look again at the uh, amino acid uh, basic uh, regions, what we would find is that all amino acids have some groups in common. What I'm circling here are the amine functional groups of amino acids. And then over here as well, what I'm circling that all of them have is the carboxylic acid. Um, and that's what actually give amino acids their name. They're called amino acids because they all have these two functional groups. As we're going to see uh, very shortly, this is how they actually link together to start to build the protein. There's a final group connected to that central carbon as well, and that I'll just put in a rectangle here. Um, that's what's referred sometimes overall as just the R group of a protein, of an amino acid, excuse me. Uh, the R group is just the rest of the amino acid, and that's unique to every type of amino acid. Um, there are 20 different amino acids. Each of them have a different R group. And so what order of amino acids we, we put together will ultimately influence the ultimate three-dimensional conformation. Uh, you can think of them sort of as like letters of an alphabet. We have 20 different amino acid letters that we can use to construct protein words. Okay, so ultimately we're going to discuss four different levels of structure here in our next conversation. Your book's con uh, way of discussing them is a little vague and a little bit uh, confusing, so I'm going to try and make it clearer here. What I really want you to be able to discuss for me is at each level of structure, what is interacting with each other? And then also, what kind of bonds are formed at that level? In some cases, there are uh, many types of bonds, so just be able to give me a few examples. Okay, so this is a, a diagram similar to a diagram that's in your book in the outset talking about the four levels of structure. We're going to walk through them in order, and we're going to discuss primary structure first, which is sort of uh, diagrammed up here. If we were to focus on that, we would see that what they're showing you here are different amino acids combined in a particular order. Again, the order of amino acids matters because that's going to create a particular protein shape. Um, so they're showing you amino acids combined here. Uh, we're going to zoom into that in just a minute uh, in the next slide. And what we'll see is that the amino acids might look like uh, this, zoomed in. So how do you uh, combine amino acids together is what we're going to show in this little diagram. So it turns out that amino acids have carboxyl groups and amine groups because the carboxyl of one amino acid actually combines with the amine of a neighboring amino acid. And it combines in a particular way. We're seeing this with the model kits a lot, but the OH group comes off one side and an H comes off another side, and that's what's going to form water as with all cases of dehydration synthesis. And then um, the carbon is going to be able to directly connect with the nitrogen, as shown down here.
So that has a particular name. We're going to call that a peptide bond. Uh, it's basically just a very strong covalent bond that forms between these amino acids. And again, just to make sure you're, you're uh, clear on what is interacting at this level, it's neighboring carboxyl and amine groups of, of neighboring amino acids. So we've strung them together in a kind of necklace so far. We, we, we shouldn't really call that a protein just yet because it doesn't have three-dimensional shape. Sometimes we just refer to what we have so far as a polypeptide. Okay, so we're going to move on then to secondary structure. Secondary structure comes after primary structure. And uh, we're going to see that eventually, uh, that, that as a result of this level of structure, we, we are going to get some three-dimensional character to our protein. So we're going to zoom in on this, and we see two examples of characteristic regions that form in any type of protein. Your book gives these names like alpha helix and beta sheet, or beta pleated sheet. I don't really care about those names, to be honest. I just want you to be able to understand what's happening to form both types of characteristic structures. So let's zoom in again and look at the atoms that are combining to make these shapes. Um, and we might see figures that look like this. Um, you don't need to worry about really what's going on here too much, but these black atoms are carbon, the red are oxygens, and we have little hydrogens connected to blue nitrogens here. And you might remember that both of these are effectively polar covalent bonds. And so if you have polar covalent bonds, then you have slight negatives and slight positives interacting together. And that's the bond that's forming at regular intervals in secondary structure. These are little hydrogen bonds. So what's actually going on here is that it's, once again, it's little carboxyls and little amines that are interacting with each other again. But they're sort of carboxyls and amines that used to be far apart from each other. Um, and now that the uh, whole polypeptide is starting to fold in on itself, they're starting to come together and form hydrogen bonds. So not quite as strong as the peptide bonds we saw in primary structure, but still strong enough to hold the protein in a particular shape. So moving on to tertiary structure. Tertiary structure is shown down here. And uh, you can see that as a result, you get all kinds of different shapes that can form in tertiary structure. Tertiary and secondary actually occur at the same time. They're, they're not chronologically separated. What makes secondary and tertiary different are what groups are actually interacting. Because in tertiary structure, we see R groups interacting. So here's that rest of the molecule of amino acids that uh, make the order of initial combining so important. Because when this polypeptide is once again starting to collapse on itself, you might get different interactions depending on what the R groups are. So go to that page that shows all the amino acids and convince yourself that they kind of group them into three broad types of R groups. There are nonpolar R groups, which is what is shown here. You see all CC and CH bonds, very nonpolar. And if these guys get close together in the overall folding protein, then they might van der Waal interact. Uh, the water around them and the watery cytoplasm might effectively push them deep in the protein. Okay, uh, a second type of interaction, a second type of R group are polar R groups. So there are certain uh, amino acids that have OH groups that uh, form a separation of charge, just like we've seen many times before. And you might have partial positives that link up with partial negatives uh, and form effectively hydrogen bonds. Uh, a third type of interaction, sometimes uh, R groups have full charges on them, not just partial charges. And so if uh, opposite full charges get together, then you might form very strong ionic bonds. I'm not going to show you the fourth type of interaction. Your book briefly calls it a disulfide bridge. It's really kind of a special case between two cysteine amino acids. Uh, but you don't need to know any of that for my purposes. But uh, a disulfide bridge is a very strong covalent bond. Okay, so we've got a lot of structure now, a lot of different types of bonds forming, and all we have left is this quaternary structure um, at the bottom left here. And uh, to zoom in on that, quaternary structure doesn't occur with all types of proteins. Uh, quaternary structure occurs when proteins are so large that maybe um, little subunits um, are actually constructed independent of each other. So they're all built um, of, uh, and they all go through their primary, secondary, and tertiary structure separately. And then they're finally brought together. So this actually shows 
four different independent subunits kind of combine together, and then we call that overall structure the protein. So what's interacting here are kind of independent subunits that fold it up themselves, and then they can interact in all kinds of different types of bonds. Your book doesn't really specify, uh, but my understanding is it's the same type of bonds that can form in tertiary structure. And that just kind of locks them all into an overall protein shape. Again, not all proteins do this. All right, so we've tried to cover the four levels of protein structure. Something you want to cover carefully and rewind the video if you need to, and you want to be able to walk me through this. What's interacting and what type of bonds are forming uh, at each level. Okay, so last conversation. This is covered in section 8.4 of your book, but I just want to talk about what might result from all of that folding and bonding. What are some important types of bonding sites in different proteins? So the first type of site that I figure is important to discuss is found only in enzymes, or really we only use the word active site with enzyme proteins. Uh, but that region where the substrate chemical actually um, collides with it, uh, would be the active site. So that's where it comes and forms that enzyme substrate complex and where eventually the chemical reaction is sped up. And then the products actually don't fit as well as the substrate does, so that's why they leave and allow another substrate to potentially come in if there's still more substrate around. So that's the active site of an enzyme. Um, there's a different type of binding site that I think is important because, in my opinion, all proteins have this type of site. Uh, and your book calls them allosteric sites. You can also call them regulatory sites. So um, regulatory molecules might come in to bind with a certain type of protein. And you can, you can broadly think of there being two types of, of, of regulatory molecules. In some cases, a molecule might come in and bind with the allosteric site and effectively activate the protein. So before uh, maybe this transport protein is effectively off, um, no calcium ions are coming through it at all until the activator molecule comes and binds at the allosteric site. And whenever uh, a molecule does that, when it binds to the allosteric site, it's going to cause the entire protein to change shape a little bit. In this case, maybe opening it up so that the calcium ions can go through. In other words, proteins aren't on all the time. They aren't doing their job all the time. There might be cases where they're effectively off until an activator molecule comes in to the allosteric site and turns the protein on. Um, this is reversible, so uh, the activator molecule might fall off, and then we're right back to this um, initial scenario on the left. Okay, so sometimes just the opposite can happen. Sometimes effectively a protein is on until we want to turn it off. They might have an allosteric site where an, a different type of molecule comes in, an inhibitor for that protein. And when that inhibitor binds, it once again causes a global change in the shape of the protein. That might effectively alter the shape of its active site temporarily. So maybe if the active site looks like this for an enzyme, the substrate will no longer come and bind. So we're effectively telling that enzyme, don't do your job right now. Don't bind with substrates. Um, again, usually this is a reversible process in cells. So the inhibitor might fall off. And when the inhibitor falls off, we're back to that shape. And then the enzyme is effectively back on again. Cells can control how active proteins are with this allosteric regulation. All right, so that's it for this video. We tried to introduce what proteins are made of. We tried to talk about the levels of different structure and all the bonds that form there. And I tried to introduce you as well to what kind of broad binding sites there might be as a result of a protein folding up correctly.